Hi everyone, I'm Kevin, a researcher from Google, and today I'll talk to you guys about a new recent work on lower bounds for encrypted multi-maps and circle churchable encryption in a new model that we call the leakage software model. This is a joint work with my fabulous uh, collaborators, Sarva Patel and Pino Persiano from Google and the University of Salerno, respectively. All right, so let's get into it. So the problem we're trying to solve in this, in this scenario, the problem we're considering, is sort of a user or a data owner that wishes to outsource its data to a third party set on the right or a server that's potentially untrusted. And it wants to do it in sort of a privacy preserving way. And sort of, so let's suppose, let's consider an example where let's say the user has, has already uploaded a map or a key value store, keys associated with values. So what happens is let's suppose the user wants to query for a key KI, it might send it in plain text and it would get the associated tuple VI. So what I, I guess I want to get to quickly is sort of even if all the values were encrypted using a client-side key, during sort of these queries or requests by the user, the server will learn which key was being queried. So okay, it might, it might learn it for a, single, for a single query, it might not seem so bad, but over a large sequence of operations of queries and inserts, the server will get more statistics and more, uh, comp and more detailed information. So for example, things like maybe the second key was never queried, and the 15th key was the most frequently queried uh, key. And sort of it's been shown in the past that using this sort of complex information, it can, be, it can be used to try to understand what data is being outsourced, even if the values are encrypted using a client-side key. And also it can also learn what kind of intent or algorithm the user is trying to run by, by, by just looking at these keys. So in an ideal world, what we would like is something like the following, where the user gets a key key and wants to query. Maybe it does a, a sequence of complicated uh, sort of retrievals from the server, is able to get the, val the tuple of values VI associated with KI, but it does it in such a way that the server doesn't know what the requested key is. All right, so try to try to understand to, to, to further understand this problem. What we can do is consider this this map data structure and consider the privacy spectrum that's achieved by various uh, solutions. So sort of the most basic solution is what we call plain text maps, or we usually just call as map data structures. You know, this has been a this has been a, a very classic problem. So it's actually called the dictionary problem in, in many years ago, and it's been considered for a long period of time, and it's been solved very well. So there's many solutions such as perfect hashing, the FKS hashing scheme, and cuckoo hashing, and many many more. But sort of what you get with these plain text maps is a constant overhead. So you know, when you want to retrieve a key ki. For a value for for values vi, you would get you know that value associated with that key, and similarly, it only requires order and storage. If you have n, if you want to store a key consist a table consisting of n keys and n values, you only require order and storage. On the other hand, in terms of privacy, it ends up leaking all keys and values because there's no pri privacy was not even a requirement for this case. So we can so what we can then do is consider a slightly is a, a different uh, primitive called structured encryption. So this will obviously have stronger privacy, but slightly less efficiency. So what is structured encryption? Sort of the idea is to encrypt the data structure while maintaining its operations. So the classical example that's been very heavily studied is this idea of searchable encryption, where you're essentially encrypting a search index while maintaining the operations of the search index. And there's many works in the past two decades I've listed here that consider you know, static, dynamic, and various privacy settings. But sort of at a high level, what, we, what is obtained by structured encryption for maps is you sort of typically get order one efficiency, but of course it can be higher depending on the leakage function that you get. And the privacy is obviously, it doesn't leak everything above the keys and values, but it leaks some sort of well-defined leakage function that contains various components. So things like the number of values that are associated with keys, for example. You might learn key equality between operations, which we'll get to a little more later, but it's, it's sort of learning whether two operations are performed with the same key. And sort of you might also learn the number of operations the user performs. So sort of this is uh, on this spectrum, this is sort of a slightly more less, uh, slightly more private but less efficient primitive. So finally, to complete the spectrum, we can go even further to the right and consider something that's much more private but much less efficient, which, we, which, is the, which, is, which can be built from things like oblivious RAMs. So what is an oblivious RAM? Essentially, it was introduced by Goldreich and Ostrovsky in, in the 90s. There's been many works in, that, uh, you know, that led to something of the order log and optimal overhead constructions. But sort of what happens is they can actually, in an oblivious RAM can actually implement a map using log and overhead. And this turns out to be tight based on lower bounds and various models that have over the past couple of decades. 
But for privacy, what you end up getting is something very, very strong. What, what it turns out is that the adversary cannot distinguish any two sequences of the same length that could have been performed by the user. So you know, translating this to the, to the world of leakage functions, what essentially it says is that the leakage function consists only of either the length of the operational sequence or an upper bound of the, the operational sequence. So in essence, what happens is you sort of have this, this spectrum where you know, the left is the most efficient but the least private. And as you move to the right, you get less, you, you trade efficiency for more privacy. All right, so in this work, what we're really gonna focus on is actually this area between structured encryption and oblivious RAM. As you can see, there is a, there's a gap in efficiency from constant to log n. And similarly for leak it, for privacy where, you, where oblivious RAMs are in some ways the ideal or the optimal privacy, whereas the structured encryption ends up leaking some very non-trivial, very informative leakage that the, the adversary could use to try to get information, to try to compromise the data. And what we're essentially trying to do is trying to figure out how this, how this sort of uh, ramp goes. Is it sort of a direct jump? Are, are there more things here that, are there more things we can construct that are, have less than login efficiency, but better privacy than the structured encryption schemes? Of course, to study this, I, stuff, I, have to, I sort of have to tell you what structured encryption actually obtained, because right now I've just said it's a non-trivial leakage function. So it turns out that structured encryption can actually be defined using a very simple hash and encrypt compiler, or you know, many of these uh, structured encryption uh, schemes. So the idea of a hash encrypt compiler is to take any plain text operations with, let's say, three operations, insert keys values, get keys, delete keys. You know, these are, this is a plain text map that has, that's only trying to, to get to, to implement these operations efficiently and without any privacy. So for example, let's suppose uh, we, we've implemented this using a plain, using the keys and values in plain text like we did before. So the idea of the hash encrypt compiler is sort of simply store a client side private key that consists of actually two keys of a hash key and an encryption key and simply replace each of the keys with a hash of the key and replace all the values with an, in, with an NCPA encryption of the values. And it turns out, you know, it's very, this is not a very complicated transformation, but it still enables men, uh, both, for example, queries. If you wanted to query for a key KI, the user simply hashes lo uh, locally and sends the hash to the server, and the server will look up the hash in the plain text map and return the associated encryption of values. Or if it doesn't exist, it returns null. Similarly, if you wanted to insert a key with some value bi, you just send a hash to the key and an NCBA encryption of the value, and, and the server would simply perform the plain text operation of inserting the hashed key to be associated with the encryption of the value bi, right, such as that. So let's take a look at what the leakage of the hash and encrypt compiler is. So when you do, let's say, an insert for cat uh, with uh, the string 0, 1, what ends, up what ends up being revealed is that the server sees a hash of cat, an encryption of the string 0, 1, and the fact that you're doing an insertion, because the server has to know whether it's doing a query to either to, to do a query to the underlying plain text map or an insertion to the underlying plain text map. And maybe you do another insertion for dog, so with, with, uh, with the value 0, 0, so you get you know, you get a hash of dog and an encryption of zero zero, and you know you're inserting, and so on and so forth. So let's let's analyze what leakage or what the adversary can learn by viewing this information. So first, of course, it learns the type of, of operation performed. Like I said earlier, the server has to know what whether it's doing an, uh, a get or an insert into the underlying plain text map. So obviously, it has to learn the type of operations the user is performing. It also learns the length of the query response. So here, for example, you know, in the first query it learns that there's one associated uh, encryption with, with, the, with the query keyword. Whereas for the fifth you know, for the, for the fifth operation, this query for cat, it learns that there's two encryptions actually associated with the, with the query. And finally, this last but, but very important leakage is this key quality pattern. So what the key quality pattern states is essentially that the server can identify which uh, operations are being performed for the same, on the same plain text key. So take an example of these, the, the, the first, the fourth, and the fifth operation. In all of these operations, the server, learn, the server is given a hash of cat, which is deterministic. And since it's deterministic, what the server can quickly de, uh, infer is that all three operations are being performed on the same keyword, plaintext keyword. But what I want to iterate is, reiterate is that the server doesn't learn which plaintext keyword it was, it was being performed. So it wouldn't know it's cat, but it knows that all three of these operations are performed on the same key. Similarly, for the other two operations, since they're both performed on dog, the server learns that they're both performed on the same keyword. 
So in essentially, long story short, what the key quality pattern says is that for any two operations, you learn whether they perform on the same key or not. So it turns out actually that surprisingly, this ends up matching the leakage of many of, of almost all of the best uh, structured encryption schemes with constant overhead. So, you know, it's this area. It's sort of this, uh, you know, in the privacy spectrum, it's this red box. So a very good question is, can we do better? So let's take a look at the three leakage functions and see what we can mitigate in terms of leakage. In terms of the type of operation performed is actually quite easy to mitigate because what the user could always do is perform all possible operation types and, and sort of replace everything that's not a real operation with a mock one. So for example, if you're doing a query, you can also do a mock insert. If you're doing an insert, you can also do a mock query. Well, the length of the query response is a little more tricky. It's, it's in, in fact, it's very hard to mitigate because you sort of have to pad the responses to always be the maximum. And there's been several works recently, like Kamara Muataz and Eurocrypt 19, as well as a work from our group in CCS 19 that sort of show various solutions to volume hiding uh, structured encryption schemes. But the, the whole point is that sort of, it gets very messy if you want to hide the length of query responses because you have to pad. So what we can then do is actually focus on this third leakage pattern called the key equality pattern and try to figure out you know, what happens if we try to consider a slightly weaker notion of, uh, of uh, key quality, or a slightly smaller leakage or stronger for stronger privacy. So let's take a look again at uh, the key quality pattern. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just define to you something we call the decoupled key quality pattern. So like we said before, in the first, fourth, and fifth operations, you know, the, the first and fourth operations are inserts, and the fifth operation is a query. The adversarial server learns that all three of them, all these, all three of these operations are performed on the same key, cat. Even though it doesn't learn what cat is, the decoupled key quality pattern essentially decouples the key qualities between inserts and query operations. So what would happen now is that the uh, this this adversarial server will still learn whether two insert operations are performed on the same key or not, and whether the same whether two query operations are performed on the same key or not. However, we decouple the information that the adversary can see between inserts and queries. So for example, for an insert operation and a query operation, the server would never learn whether these two operations are performed on the same key or not. And sort of this is de denoted by the fact that we, we change the color of this, this cat for the query into a different color. Similarly, we can, we, we can do the same thing for this dog operation where, again, even though they're queried for the same keyword, now we can try to construct a scheme where somehow the adversarial server would not learn that this insert and query are performed for the same key. All right, so actually this leads us sort of to our main result. So what we actually end up proving is that any encrypted multi-map with leakage at most the decoupled key equality pattern must have omega login overhead. And actually this turns out to be a very, this lower bound is tight because of there exists order login or RAM based encrypted multi-maps that end up leaking much less than the decoupled key equality pattern. So sort of going back to this privacy spectrum, what we end up showing is actually that essentially everything just slightly to the right of the structured encryption schemes. Because like I said, we, we showed before earlier with like hashing encrypt compiler that any sort of a scheme that is able to leak the key equality pattern can have order one efficiency. But as soon as you aim for something even slightly stronger in terms of privacy, let's say the decoupled key equality pattern, which doesn't really have many real world implications, doesn't actually harden any sort of system, theoretically it ends up requiring these uh, schemes to, to use login overhead which ends up matching oblivious ramps. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is, if, you're gonna, if you want anything slightly stronger than, than structured encryption, in terms of theoretical asymptotics, you might as well go all the way to oblivious ramps. All right, so this is our result, and let's, let's go about trying to prove it. So to prove this lower bound, we end up using something called the cell probe model, or the leakage cell probe model, where we incorporate leakage functions. So the idea of the cell probe model is sort of you have, a, again, you have the user on the left and the server on the right, and the server's memory is essentially split up into something called cells, and each cell is the same length. The only cost in the cell probe model is essentially accessing any parts of server memory. So accessing, so one unit cost in this model essentially is, means either reading or writing, what, which we call also probing, a cell in this, of, of the server memory. So it turns out that's the only cost we consider in the cell probe model, everything else is free. So things like computation, random oracles, accessing client storage, it's all free. So you can solve your favorite NP hard problem if you wanted to for free, stuff like that. And sort of, okay, why we consider a very weak cost model is that it ends up being very strong lower bounds. If you were to consider a more realistic model where computation is, uh, is cost some amount of, uh, 
you know, is, is some, is cost some expense, same thing as randomness generation or access to client storage, our lower bounds will still hold. In other words, the cell pro model is, is in some ways the holy grail of lower bounds as it's the weakest uh, cost model. So the technique we use to prove our lower bound is the information transfer technique introduced by Petrascu and Domain in 2006. And sort of the high level idea of the, of the information transfer technique is to sort of arrange how information is transferred between various operations that are performed. So sort of the idea is let's suppose you do N operations, you know, which I've listed sort of top, bottom, top to bottom here, operation one to operation N. And what we do is we're gonna build a virtual binary tree over these N operations. What does that mean? Essentially what we mean is we're gonna build a binary tree with N leaves such that each operation is assigned to a unique leaf in sort of chronological order. So the, 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 most, the, the first operation is assigned to the topmost leaf and the second operation is assigned to the second most top leaf and so on and so forth. So like I said in the cell pro model, each of these operations, you know, so let's say you're reading or writing to the encrypted multimap, is actually implemented using cell reads and cell writes. So for example, whatever operation one was, it's actually, it may, it's implemented using, for example, reading the, 50, the cell at the address 15, writing something to address, uh, cell address 17, 72, and writing something to cell address 220, and so on and so forth. So what we're actually gonna do now is, is sort of uh, go iterate through every single cell read that occurs in this operation, in this, in this operational sequence, and assign the red cell address to some unique node in, the, in this information transfer tree. So for example, let's suppose we took a, an arbitrary cell read, let's say cell read 15, right, that's to perform an operation three. What we then do is we go back and find the most recent operation that ended up writing to address uh, to cell address 15. So that might be operation one. And what we end up doing then is we're gonna assign cell address 15 to the lowest common ancestor of the leaf nodes that are associated with operation one and operation three. And in this case, it happens to be the root of the tree. And we do this sort of for every single address that's read in all N operations. So what I will, this is, this is sort of the key point of the information transfer technique is sort of that the way we define and assign these cell addresses ends up defining the total amount of information that's being transferred. So let's, uh, to, to explain this carefully, let's consider a concrete example of this specific red node in this tree. And this red node will have a seat, will have like several cell addresses that are assigned to it. And what these cell addresses signify is the total amount of information that's transferred from operations that are performed in the top subtree, so this top subtree of this red node, that would be used by operations in the bottom subtree of this red node. So for example, let's say somehow operation, you know, the, an operation in the top subtree wrote something to a specific, uh, wrote, overwrote a value for a specific key and that key is later read in the bottom subtree. Obviously that information for, for, the, for the data structure to be correct, that information must be transferred from the top subtree to the bottom subtree. And what, I, and what I'm trying to, and what the information transfer technique shows is that actually the total amount of information that, that's, uh, that's transferred is, must exist in the cells assigned to this red node. And to sort of see this, what we can go through is sort of try some examples. So let's say we take this blue, this blue node and try to say, maybe could any cell address that's assigned here somehow transfer nodes from, the, from, the, from the, the top subtree of this red node to the bottom subtree of this red node? And if you sort of think about it quickly, the answer is it can't because of any cell address that's assigned to this blue node would be read in, a, in an operation that is already performed in the top subtree of this red node. So in fact, uh, there can't be any information in cell address that are assigned here that can be transferred, uh, that, that's, 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 if that's transferred from the top subtree of the red node to the bottom subtree of the red node. Similarly, you can do another analysis, maybe pick another tree, that, uh, pick another node that's a parent of the red node. And again, let's suppose some cell address is assigned here. That would mean it's, it's written in, you know, in, in, some, in, 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 in the top subtree of, this, uh, of the blue node, which consists of the whole tree rooted at the red node. And it would be, it would be read somewhere in the bottom subtree, which is sort of not important for any, uh, any operations that performed in this, uh, that's performed in the bottom subtree of this red node. So in other words, what, what we end up, what, it, what, you will, what you end up seeing is that all the information transferred from the top subtree of the red node to the bottom subtree of the red node must exist in the cells that are assigned in the red node. 
So why is this important? Well, it turns out what we're end up going to do, we're going to find, a, we're going to find operations that maximize the, the number of cell addresses that are assigned to each, to, to each internal node. So let's, again, let's look at this red node. And what we can essentially do is try to find an op, a sequence of operations that would maximize the number of cell addresses that, would be, that have to be assigned to the red node. So in fact, it's actually very simple to do this. What you can do is in the top subtree, put a bunch of inserts. In the bottom subtree, we can do a bunch of queries. And sort of what we're going to do is, you know, we insert to uh, to unique indices in the top subtree with uh, with these values that are completely random, and then in the bottom subtree you simply query them. So we're trying to uh, so using this idea, what we're going to do is now actually construct our lower bound. So for our lower bound, we have to find some hard sequence, and the hard sequence we essentially choose is something very simple. It's like you know insert to one a random value v, and then subsequently read it, insert to uh, index two, and subsequently read it, and so on and so forth. And we assume that how, how we generate these values has a large amount of entropy. So OK, you might ask right off the bat, isn't this operation easy to handle? And sort of the key is that the sequence is indistinguishable from, a, from many sequences with identical leakage. So taking a look, let's, let's, look, at the, let's look at this hard, uh, this hard distribution. What we can quickly see is that this hard sequence ends up maximizing you know, all of these red nodes, the number of solvers that we assigned to this red node, for example. Let's look at this uh, this top red node. Clearly, you know all of the all the operations in this top subtree are inserts that are subsequently queried in the bottom subtree. So, okay, this hard sequence at least uh, maximizes the cell addresses for maximum cell addresses assigned to, you know, this uh, this whole this whole level of nodes. But what we can then do is actually slightly modify the operation. So, for example, let's say we take the queries and change them. So, what we do is we change these two queries to be dummies. And we actually query, uh, you know, the key one and key two in in the bottom subtree. And maybe you, we, to make sure the leakage remains the same between the two operations, you might have to add some sort of header where you insert a bunch of dummies that can be queried later. So if you take a look at this new construct, at this new uh, sequence, which has the the same leakage as the original hard distribution which I just described, it turns out that this sequence ends up maximizing the number of cell addresses up to a constant factor of two the number of cell addresses that have to be assigned to this red, red node. And you can do this repetitively for each internal node in the tree. So sort of what ends up happening, how we prove this lower bound is sort of, you know, we use these ideas to show that many probes must be assigned to half the internal nodes for this easy hard, for this easy hard distribution. And then what we, have, what we also know is that each cell read or probe is assigned to at most one internal node in the tree. So by simply summing up the probes assigned over all nodes provides a lower bound. So what I'm trying to say is sort of, if for some reason there was not enough uh, cell uh, cells that are assigned to this red node, we would know that this specific uh, sequence couldn't exist. So for privacy, you have to assign the maximum cell addresses, the maximum cells addresses that have to be at this red node according to this uh, this distribution. And if you do this for all of them, you get you just sum up the maximums over all internal nodes and you get the lower bound. All right, so it turns out that, so that actually completes our lower bound from a very high level, the information transfer technique. But it turns out that you can actually modify the, the lower bound to get the, the more, modify the proof to get stronger lower bounds. So it turns out that we can prove lower bounds in our paper even when one of the insert operations are performed in plain text or the query operations are performed in plain text. Furthermore, we can actually uh, use, this, uh, use this lower bound for encrypted multimaps to end up proving lower bounds for dynamic searchable encryption. And in fact, what we show is that by, by this, this uh, decoupled key equality ends up actually being something called response hiding in dynamic searchable encryption, where you hide the actual documents that are, that are associated with any query key. And what we prove is that such response hiding dynamic searchable encryption schemes end up requiring login overhead. And again, this is tight because there actually end up being ORAM-based solutions for these, for these the dynamic searchable encryption schemes that are response hiding. So, okay, so that, that completes sort of uh, what we did in this paper. There turns out to be recently a large number of other works that, that prove cryptographic lower bounds in the cell probe model. So there's the seminal uh, Oblivious Ram paper by Larson and Nielsen, as well as several follow-ups that I list here that if you're interested in, you should, uh, you should go explore. All right, so thanks for listening to my talk and I hope you enjoyed and learned something.